Welcome to Command Control Power, a weekly podcast hosted by three certified members of the Apple Consultants Network, drawing from over half a century of combined experience. We talk shop, interview vendors and colleagues, and share what we've learned while operating our technology consulting practices. Visit commandcontrolpower.com for show notes and click support to join our community for exclusive access to patron-only episodes, special features, merchandise, and other membership perks. This is Joe Sapinari of Cymac, and my two co-hosts are Jerry Zygmunt of MacWorks and Sam Valencia of the HCS Technology Group. Thanks for listening. So I've had a whirlwind uh, week or so, guys. First order of business was my dad. He had a birthday coming up, and he's well into his late 80s. He recently stayed over our house. He loves Audible. So when he was staying over, we have a family room area with a pullout couch. But it's not our living room, but it's a family room area. So we all go to bed. We're all on the second floor. He's on the first floor. And then like at 1130 at night, quarter to 12, we hear this thing. And it sounds like somebody's talking downstairs. And, I, and then <laughs> so I go to the landing, you know, of the second floor. And I'm like, Dad, Dad, what are you doing? And he was listening to Audible, and it was like blasting out of his <laughs> iPhone. And he's like, what? What? You can hear that? I'm like, what do you mean? You just woke up the whole house. Dad, turn it off. He goes, oh, I'll turn it down. So he thinks he turns it down, and it's still like really loud. He said, well, what are we going to get him? So we'll, we'll get him some AirPods, AirPod Pros. So we go on Amazon, order up a pair of AirPod Pros. And it was like a Monday or a Tuesday, and his birthday was Friday. You'll get them the next day or the day after. So fine, I'm going to see them Wednesday or Thursday. Wednesday th rolls around, I don't see them. And that's really weird. And so I log into Amazon. It is this tracking is delayed. Then I check on it on Thursday. And now I'm like, oh, man, like now I've got to go to the Apple store and I've got to buy another pair. So I traipse down to the Apple store in my, in my local city, buy a pair at the $249 price instead of the $179 price that I paid at Amazon. And I'm like, I'm miffed. I'm, I'm not happy about this. All of a sudden I look and it says package forwarded. It was sent out through the United States Postal Service, which I thought was really odd because we're Amazon Prime subscribers. So normally if, if you have something that's guaranteed for the next day, unless you've got an Amazon Depot like a mile away or so, they're not going to send it through the post office. So I thought this was really, really odd. And then I ordered, you know, something like masks the following day and some other little ancillary item. And those all of a sudden started to show that they were shipped out through USPS and it said forwarding address on file. So I drive down to my local rural post office and I walk in there and they're like, yeah, your mail's being forwarded. And I'm like, wait a minute, time out, time out. So a guy says, hold on a second. He goes behind the secret thing that you can't see and he comes back and he's got a label in his hand to the address in Texas with my name on it. Wow. Wow. He said, yeah, you, you know, you're going to have to stop the forwarding. And I said, well, I, I thought, you know, when you do forwarding, you need to physically go down to a post office, prove identity a couple different ways, maybe with a license and a credit card or something like that, and physically fill out a form. And I double checked this and I looked online and that is indeed true. You can't forward mail. You can hold mail online and we've done that for vacations, but you can't forward to a forwarding address. You have to physically go down to the post office. And I'm I don't like, think that's true, actually. In my, I did this uh, last year, and I didn't have to go to a post office. I'm trying to remember what I. Yeah, I thought you had to double confirm it, receive a piece of mail at the new address, and like say, say yes to it or so. All right, I don't know, start shooting holes from my story, Joe. I, mean, no, I have a I, real I, good I, story I, going here, and you don't interrupt them. Like I got the popcorn. <laughs> and I'm really interested. In what's going to happen here? I think you're right, Jerry. It should not be as easy as it, I think, it actually turns out to be in practice. But go ahead. I went back to my home and I logged into the USPS service that I've got an account on. And I'm looking at, like, how do I reverse this out? How do I stop the forwarding to some random address in Texas? There's no place online that you can do this. It has to be filed through the post office. You can't do this digitally. So the postmaster calls me the day later and they're like, OK, yeah, no, we've we've removed the forwarding. I said, well, how does this happen? They said, well, you need to report it. And I 
said, well, I've done that. I've gone online to a separate address where you can report theft, identity theft. In this case, I wasn't really claiming anything because Amazon, of course, stood behind the package and refunded all the money for the goods that were sent. The only thing I could choose was like identity theft. But the odd thing is what seemingly triggered it was ordering this small, high value package through Amazon. Now, my account isn't compromised in any way. I've got a very secure password. I changed my password. I don't see any other flim flam. And this was really not done on the surface level inside my Amazon account. This order that was placed and somehow it got flagged in their system by some evildoer. And they're like, yeah, we'll just forward this on to Texas. I can't figure out how this was done. Wait, who's, whose system are you saying got on the USPS side? I have no idea. Amazon doesn't want to take any ownership of this. They said, this is all about the post office. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. Why did this package that was supposed to be Amazon Prime, why was this sent out through the post office when we know that you're not going to get next day for Amazon Prime in most cases it seems like the vector of attack was when they chose how to send the package out. Well, I do you think, think, think this was like an inside job on the USPS side. I well, mean, was it an outside job? Well, <laughs> all right. I'm talking about like a rogue employee that may have done. Something. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. That's where we're going. Well, all right. So let's let's take a step back and look at the facts. You ordered something from Amazon and it was shipped. USPS does handle Amazon packages. For a while, I remember they were dealing with stuff like on the weekend even. I think they yeah. were doing deliveries on Sundays, for example, that used to be you know, UPS or something, but it, USPS got a contract with Amazon to like handle some of their packages. You know, I don't know what the details were, but I, I, I have gotten Amazon packages via USPS also. So I don't think that's any kind of concern. I think the other thing we know is like, obviously there was forwarding in place from your address to some other address. So the only question is like, how do you do forwarding? How do you do mail forwarding? So I did this. I did this when I sold my condo. I hadn't been living there full time in a while. I think I had mail forwarding from there to my office address for a while. And then when I sold it, I had to have it forwarded to my new residence. And so I went online and did that. I didn't have to walk in. I definitely did not walk into any USPS location. I did that forwarding online and I remember what's protecting this whole process. Like what ensures that you know, somebody doesn't just log in and like create forwarding that's totally fake. And I, I don't recall like what it was that I usually think that stuff through. If I notice a possible vector like that, I try to like figure out, is there something protecting this or like, how could this be exploited? And then if I can think of how it could be exploited, it's already being exploited in that case. And I think we're finding that probably this vector of attack exists and you can just log in and forward mail. I don't know what pretense you need. I don't know if you need to like have... I think I had to receive a piece of mail at that location, though. I'm pretty sure that's the kind of fail safe is like you do get mail at the original address, internal mail from the USPS that says your mail is being forwarded. If you don't do anything, it's going to be forwarded. If you do do something, let us know if this is a mistake or something like that. I think that was the, the way that it works. Well, so you're, I, you're, I do stand corrected. You can go online and you could do a change of address, put in your contact information, put in your address, your old address, and your new address. Interestingly, this mail address is not a mail drop, which I thought it would be. It's actually a physical home on the plains of Texas. <laughs> uh, so someone had to go through the trouble of doing this. I, I still have the burning question of how was this triggered? And by what means was the bad guy, the perp, as we call them in the crime world. How was that information called? Yeah, why did they target you, you know, and how were they successful in forwarding your mail and why to Texas? <laughs> like those are, yeah, you know, those as are great questions. As far as why, I, I think, you know, us talking about his castle on this show all the time, you know, that probably uh, alerted could some. Could be a of, listener, yeah. It's, it's probably yeah. a listener is where I'm going with this. <laughs> wow, some freaking address in Texas, like some house. That's kind of crazy. Although, I mean, the fact that there's cars in the driveway, like, you know, you think maybe like an abandoned address or something, you know. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I've definitely heard of that scam. It before. could be it's just like, like you know. yeah, it could be just like an elderly couple or something. They don't check things often or right. and people literally just grab stuff off the stoop. 
Right, but it's right. bizarre. It's not like I ordered a Samsung two thousand dollar TV sent through Amazon. I don't think that's what triggered it. I think that somebody was scamming you, and the first thing that you know happened to be forwarded was this Amazon package. You know, it could have yeah, been that's... some letters. I mean, I imagine you didn't get any mail uh, for a little while, right? Yeah our town is so small that the carrier said like, yeah, I mean, I saw these things, but like, I'm wondering like, what are you doing in Texas? The moment it happened was the moment I ordered that, those AirPods. I don't think it was the AirPods. Right. At yeah. All. I, I mean, there's no, there's timing. no reason to think it's the AirPods. Yeah. Just, just random timing. Like it just happened to be the next thing that you ordered was the AirPods after this, this forwarding request got. All right. Well, I want you guys to figure this out and then get back to me on this. <laughs> I think we should go there. I think we should go to 1514 Stony Creek drive in Cleburne, Texas. You're the closest Joe. I guess so. On the plus side, Jerry, you can now vote in Texas. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know good. which way I'm going to pull the lever for sure. Yeah, 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 exactly. There you go. One more vote for the good guys. Right, <laughs> exactly. Wow. Well, that's a crazy story. I mean, be, you know, be aware. I feel like this is how this stuff comes to everybody's consciousness is, is like you start to hear about people being scammed. That What's the fix for this? Because the Postal Service probably, you know, it's like it's a legitimate thing to be able to forward your mail to a new address when you move. <laughs> how does the Postal Service know you really did move there? It, you know, there needs to be a, a way to confirm this. I mean, it reminds me of like tax fraud that has started happening a few years ago. It's like if you didn't have an IRS account. Somebody went in and just said, like, I'm going to make an account for this person for whatever reason. It's like if you had enough basic information, you could just make the account. So this solution is make your account uh, so that you can protect it so that you can you know, protect it with a password and you know, stronger authentication and stuff. It's oftentimes the initial there needs to be an easy way to initially create the account or in this case, like start forwarding mail. But if you've already got an account then it's protected by like whatever additional authentication steps you you provide. So I wonder if there's a like a parallel here to like IRS tax fraud protecting yourself against that by having an, an account on irs.gov. Maybe there's a way. I mean, I guess you said though that you had a USPS account already when this happened. That's right. You know, I think for the average person to protect themselves or one of the listeners, it's like I never saw this coming. The most likely thing is maybe it's the frequency of ordering on Amazon, and I, I have no idea. I just think it's there's something more here that meets the eye. I'd be curious to know, yeah, any follow up on that or how it plays out. And I'm sure other, you know, we may have another listener who's who's been through this already, who did a deeper dive on like how to protect yourself or what the kind of threat model was there. That's a real concern. I mean, if it happened to you like randomly and there's no by no fault of your own, it's probably going to become a bigger issue for people. Put in a request for the postal inspector to get back to me. But I, I would imagine there's hundreds of requests like this all, all the time. And so it's the order of magnitude. You know, I wasn't claiming anything. I wasn't claiming a dollar amount. So it's not a high priority. But some of my mail was probably forwarded. Maybe the Ed McMahon Publishers Clearinghouse sweepstakes <laughs> was there and it was forwarded to Texas. You could now already they, be a winner. and <laughs> Could have been, yeah. You have no way of knowing now. No, it's gone. All right. So as a little brief interlude, I have a quick trivia question for you guys. So this is via Mac Admin Slack. It was Adam Berti in the Mac Admin Slack that asked this question. And a different Adam, Adam Kodiga, said... This is a fun trivia question. So I thought, I don't I haven't heard anybody else ask this question. I'm going to ask the question. So credit where credit is due. Those those guys kind of brought this up. I don't know the answer. So I don't know if that's more fun or less fun as a trivia question that I don't know <laughs> the answer to. So the trivia question is, does anyone know if a factory Visa mount iMac has the serial number somewhere on the Mac, right? Because you're you, if you're looking at an iMac on your desk, where's the serial number? Well, it's on the bottom of the stand. <laughs> So if there's no factory stand, where is a serial number printed? I was not able to find the answer. I did a lot of research. I, I mean, not a lot of time, but I did my furious Google searching to try to figure out the answer, and I could not find the answer. The best thing I could find from Apple was that Apple hardware product serial numbers might have the number zero, 
but never the letter O. So there's your little bonus trivia question. <laughs> like when clients are <laughs> reading you the, the thing, it's always a zero. It's never a letter O. So now you know from Apple directly that that's the case. But where is a serial number printed on a Visa mount iMac? Do you guys have any idea? I have no answer for you, Joe. I'm looking at a Reddit thread and they're saying that it's not there. Now this may change on the new monitors, but on previously older monitors, it's not there. Yeah, because I mean, you can you can order the new Apple Studio display with with no stand with the Visa mount from the factory. I wonder if it's on that product. It has to be. You would think so. I you know I thought the same thing. Like, okay, well, you can't possibly like require me to either open the computer up to find the serial number. You know, because if it's not bootable, then how do you find the serial number? What if you have a logic board replaced in that iMac? You know, in a Visa mount iMac then the logic board in the machine is going to have a different serial number than the original hardware does. So is there any record of the original serial number on the hardware? That's another kind of weird edge case. We'll have to spend some of our company budget and buy one and then come up with the answer for the show. Good plan. I'm on board with that. Just don't ship it to Jerry. That's all. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say free <laughs> shipping to Texas. <laughs> right. <laughs> so here at home, we have a 2018 MacBook Pro Retina that's just out of Apple Care. It's my wife's machine and she does a little bit of graphic design on the side for the school, you know, not for profit work. Uh, she doesn't make a living doing it. We were having trouble with the battery, not holding a charge. So we sent it out, made it under the wire through Apple Care. It hadn't expired and they replaced the battery in top assembly. All very nice. So we had it 60 days, 90 days warranty on any of the work that Apple does. Because that was still in play, we were experiencing random shutdowns, not kernel panics, but random shutdowns. Wanted to try to get some more satisfaction before any more time elapsed. So I reached out again, spoke to an Apple advisor, and I said this was in to the depot for repair. They replaced the battery, but now we're experiencing random shutdowns. They wrote up the ticket. They sent me a box, and that's the way I always do it. I never bring it to the store. I always get a box. Put it in the box, send it out. It arrives this past Thursday. Box comes in. I open up the box. I look at the piece of paper, and I'm expecting probably a logic board, power supply, who knows? It says replace top assembly and battery. They did the first work order twice. Oh, so, so I immediately work, yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not that it needed a new battery. It's right. that there was a mistake. So I get on the phone immediately, talk to a senior Apple advisor, long time on the phone, long waits. Gentleman was very nice. Oh, yeah, I see what happened here. You know, this is our mistake. This is completely on us. And he took some extra time to write up the ticket and to detail what he at least made an assessment of what the computer might need. And I said, you know, I've got the box because it just came in like an hour ago. I said, can you just send me over a label? So he sent me over a label. This was on a Thursday, last Thursday. So I hustle over to the FedEx office, send it off. Weekend goes by, on Monday morning, I see it arrives not in Austin, Texas, or that general area where one of the depots is, but it arrives in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. It says that it arrived at 9.03 in the morning on Monday. I'm clicking on the link that Apple provides to you to find the status for your repair, and it says something like, waiting for repair, meaning that it doesn't even show that the label's been initiated, anything like that. Coincidentally, on that same Monday that it arrived in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, I get an empty box. They actually did not start repairing it until today. And it said, technician is evaluating your machine. And then it said, <laughs> no information is available. So it didn't say it went out. It said that it, they were evaluating it. And then it kind of like fell offline again, where there's no information available. All during this time, you can imagine, you know, I'm just trying to hustle it along. And I, I must say that a lot of times Apple repair is amazing. Yeah, I've seen cases where you send it out on Monday, you get it back on Wednesday, and they completely yeah. rebuilt the machine. Completely right. mind-blowing. Fantastic service. But when they stumble, they really stumble hard. You know, there were many calls that I made speaking to senior advisors who really couldn't say anything other than, yeah, well, we see it's arrived, you know, in Carlisle, but it hasn't been checked in. So it took them three days to check it in. And currently the status is unknown on the on the device. It's just a little bit frustrating. I just thought I would share that to contrast. Most of the time, it's fantastic stuff. 
So I was wondering, have you guys ever encountered that with maybe one of your own repairs or something for, like that for a client recently? The only one that comes to mind that I can relate to was entirely my fault, ultimately, <laughs> where I got an email from Apple, your repair has been canceled. What do you mean my repair is canceled? What? Look into it. I call them up. They're like, no, we, we have no uh, information on this. And I'm like, what the heck happened? Like, what do you mean? You know, it was embarrassing to the length that I went to to try to like track this down ultimately to figure out that I never sent the machine out to them. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like, it's like on one of my brief like trips back East, I had this inherited machine that was, well, okay, this Mac boots, but it's got the backlight issue. I think it was something like that. This is a little bit of a stretch because like the age of the machine, but you know, let's just see, like maybe Apple is going to give me like a flat rate, you know, repair. And then like I could have a working computer or, you know, that I could repurpose or like resell or whatever. Maybe they'll fix under Apple care. Maybe it was a repair extension program, like worth a try. I think the box didn't get there in time or whatever. And I lost track of it. And so we, we never sent it out. I was like chasing that for like a ridiculous amount of time. Like, for, you know, I spent like time on the phone with Apple trying to get more information about it, doing the searches in my notes to figure out like, when did I send this out? What, which Mac was this? Yeah. It all started because I got like a random email like a month later from Apple basically being like, well, you never sent us the machine, so we're giving up. And it, they didn't say that though. Like the the email was misleading it was something like you declined this repair or something like that and i'm like i never declined this you know <laughs> so <laughs> yeah so that was my the only thing i could relate to but i i've had more of the pro experience where it's miraculously fast you know it's like you get the box the next day and you turn it around that same day and send it back out and then so essentially apple gets it like the next day, you know, and then like you said, they do the repair and turn it around and you have it the third day or something. It's like amazingly right. fast. You know, it's way better. Like we used to think, well, I don't want to ship it out. I just want to bring it to the store. And then the store stopped basically doing most repairs. And even in the store, you know, it would, it could take a, a week. So mailing it out has actually always been a pretty decent option. And I even recommend, you know, clients have the box sent to them. Don't even go to the Apple store and have it sent out. Call a number. Even before you put it in the box, you open up the box and the repaired machine is in there. <laughs> right, exactly. In speaking to one of the senior advisors and the regular advisors that take Apple Care calls is that they've recently gotten some new training. And so they're asking the question, what is your goal for us today? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Like we've been talking for 20 minutes. My goal is you repaired the machine wrong the second time around. And if you did it right, I'd have my machine by now. The goal is I want my machine back. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so recently we had a few new Mac OS versions, a few new iOS versions come out. The trend in the last couple of years seems to be pretty regular, pretty frequent updates. You know, we've certainly seen more zero days become exploited and therefore, you know, more patches more frequently. I think back to the days where it seemed like this was paced out a little bit more over the course of time. Like we would have what felt like weeks, if not months in between even minor updates, but it seems like more frequent lately. One thing that wasn't certain until recently was would, would Apple continue to support the prior Mac OS versions? you know, or how many prior versions they don't really say, which is something that's frustrating in the kind of enterprise, you know, is not knowing if your, you know, your fleet might be on a version of Mac OS that you don't really know for sure that Apple's going to continue to provide support for security updates specifically. So for example, like we had the 12.2.1 update came out after 12.2 was released. And then there was a delay before 11.6.4 came out. And then Catalina, the 2022-002 security update, those were delayed a little bit later than 12.2.1. I think for a few days there, I was thinking to myself, okay, so Monterey has been patched with this significant, yet another significant zero day. Catalina hasn't received any update yet. So, you know, Catalina is only two versions prior to the current Mac OS version. Apple dropped Mojave right before Monterey even shipped. So at that time, Big Sur was the current and they weren't updating Mojave. You know, at that time it was like, well, okay, up until now we've been counting on current version minus two, 
being supportable, being, you know, having security updates and stuff. There was this window before Monterey came out when they patched some stuff in Big Sur and Catalina and like ne they never patched Mojave. And then, you know, Monterey came out and it's like, OK, we're back in like sort of that implied level of compliance that Apple sort of semi promises that like we'll, we'll support the current Mac OS version and, and two versions prior. But again, like it, there was a window of time where Mojave was technically like two versions prior and it did not get an update. So I was thinking this again recently. Do we know that Catalina would be updated? And thankfully, it eventually was. But I don't know that we have any kind of guarantee from Apple. So I'm wondering if like the next Mac OS comes out and they start saying, you know, we're only going to support like this version and one prior, which is what they do with iOS. Now, that's what they started to do with iOS. They were updating iOS 14 in addition to like patching iOS 15. They were still providing security updates for iOS 14. And then I think they stopped doing that pretty quickly, didn't, didn't they? I mean, is that still an option for people to, to like update iOS 14 rather than going to iOS 15 for security updates? I think they are allowing that still. I'm not 100%, but I do recall that. I haven't actually gone through and tested it, though. Yeah, because I remember, you know, that was new when iOS 15 came out. It's like other updates are available kind of thing. And iOS 14 would right. still, the latest patches would still be there. As far as I can tell from Apple's security updates page, it looks like the last iOS 14 update that came out was back in January, I believe. My main question is, do we know that they're going to continue to support two versions prior? That's one question and concern. So they patched 12.2, 12.2.1 came out. We, along with 12.2, of course, we started to get that alert from Apple that we talked about recently about specifically Dropbox not being ready for the next 12.3 to come out, which required Dropbox to rewrite their extension. You know, 12.3 came out and we're a little bit more reluctant to update because we didn't really know if there'd be other things that broke besides what we knew would break, which is... Specifically with Dropbox, the offline file access in third-party apps, I guess, is the only kind of concern. You still have local access to your files, even if they are offline. In the Finder, you just don't have that necessarily in third-party apps. So it didn't turn, didn't turn out to be a big deal in practice, as far as I can tell. I'm still a little hesitant. What's your guys' policy on how quickly to update to 12.3, for example? And if you've updated, you know, have you had any issues with clients or with your own systems? For me, I like to defer the updates, but it depends on the office. I don't usually do a seven day deferral. Like I'll, I'll usually do like a 30 day deferral until we can suss out or hear from the World Wide Web's what people have said out there. And then I'll jump on it from there. But it, since we can do that easily through Adigy and other platforms, it's super simple to do. It makes it easy on my customers because then they don't need to even think about it unless they read about it and then they email us like, why can't I update this? And then I right. just, you know, similar to the Monterey thing. Well, for me, it's zero day. Damn the torpedoes. Just upgrade and never look back. It, it was fine. Upgrading to Monterey 12.3. The only thing that it killed was I was using a script. Someone who I had reached out to, I think on Slack, wrote me this little script to take a invoice, which is a PDF, and append our contractual terms to the back of the invoice or append it to the invoice and then plop it in an email. No fuss, no muss. It was like, bing, 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 it did it. And the way I was doing it was I was doing it through Hazel, creating a watch folder. So anytime a brand new invoice with a new number landed in this watch folder, Hazel would fire off the script and it would do the append. It would ask me what the subject line was, which was the name of, the name of our company and the invoice. And it would throw it into an email. And then I would just address it to the client and just put our signature on it. And boom, it was great. Scripts are gone or scripting is gone or they could, because they remove Python. They remove Python 2.7 and 3.0. That doesn't mean you can't run it with Monterey. You could reinstall it with Homebrew. And so I reached out to a good friend of the show, Armin Briegel, and he was like, no, you know, it's gone. And that's why your script isn't working. Um, and I actually found out about reinstalling it through homebrew a little bit later, Armin said, why don't you take a look at shortcuts? 
Now, right. I had been using a few shortcuts just for fun on the iPhone, and regularly I don't use any shortcuts as part of my workflow. I know some people live, die, and breathe with shortcuts all the time on their phone, You know, sending alerts, location alerts, all this stuff that runs in automation. And I think that's terrific, and I admire that, but I just don't use it. And I had not looked at shortcuts at all for the Mac without much messing around, and I talk about messing around took me less than 20 minutes, I was able to create an invoice and email shortcut, which did the same thing as the script did. You basically point it to the two pieces that you want to combine into a PDF, and it gives it a name, and it throws it into an email, and I was off and running. So it's a much more elegant way, I think, to do it rather than having to invoke this Python script and incorporate Hazel. It just works. That's very cool. Yeah, my first thought was shortcuts too, although I haven't had any experience really. You know, in the past, I've used Automator. Talked about that a little bit. It's certainly, like you said, I mean, it's a much more elegant solution than dealing with the command line. I mean, it's kind of the whole promise of the Mac going back 40 years. I don't know. The state of the art before the Mac, before Mac OS, before GUI interfaces, it was command line stuff. So yeah, it's certainly much easier to kind of like learn the GUI scripting or GUI shortcuts kind of interface and then also be able to change it. Like what if you want to add a third page for, you know, with a signature line or do like you could, you know, it's more extensible now for you to like be able to also modify that going forward. So what do you guys do in that case when you send out an invoice? Do you put your business terms, the little boilerplate that we see on a lot of invoices or contracts when you send them out to clients, are they attached? Do you just manually attach them or you don't send them at all? Well, how, how much are you talking in terms of boilerplate? Like, is it a lot of verbiage in there? Or is it just a couple of lines about late fees and things like that? No, it was like, you know, standard boilerplate that uh, David Sparks put together. That's one single page. So it fits very nicely on the back of the invoice. Oh, I see. Yeah. I, I mean, we don't, I don't send that out with every invoice, but we do have a little blurb about payment terms and all that stuff. And that just, we throw it right into the QuickBooks estimate or invoice that we produce. Yeah. We have some very basic text as well that just automatically gets included with, with the invoices that go out. Um, but I, I like the idea, like yours is more of a contract. It sounds like Jerry, that's like your full, you know, sort of contract terms included. Right. There's no place for the, I have a version where the client can sign. And sometimes if I was going into, let's say a real suspicious situation where I completed the work, I got paid, but I wanted to get somebody to sign for it. I would make one up with the room for the signature, but Joe, you've actually seen them. You know, I've invoiced you for some of my expensive work in the past and you've received those. So, um, that was a joke. Yeah, I know. I, yeah. I was I was waiting for <laughs> Joe to get that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got I got the expensive work part. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't I didn't get the joke. Though. It's just true. No. <laughs> <laughs> I never signed anything, Jerry. Also, by the way, I don't yeah. see where this is funny, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> My only experience with shortcuts is actually on the iPhone so far. And it was when this one went around, you guys probably saw it too. It's, you can create a shortcut with one tap on your home screen. If you ever pulled over, you know, it'll, it'll do a bunch of stuff. Like it'll start recording your, you know, it like opens the camera app and starts recording. Um, it like turns down your audio or maybe just pauses it or whatever. It also sends a message to your contacts, like, you know, certain contacts that you, that you want it to be sent to. Like I've been pulled over. I got a text one day, like something like, oh, no, Joe, I'm so sorry. Stay calm. I'm sure it'll be fine. <laughs> you know, <and> I'm like, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> like, what is this about? Oh, no. Like, I sent three people a text that said, like, I've been pulled over <laughs> right now. And, blah, blah. and that happened twice. I accidentally opened this stupid app when I was, like, putting my phone away or something. And I'm like, all right, never mind. I got to bury this app somewhere else on my phone if I'm even going to leave it here. So, That's yeah, be true. careful what you, uh, <laughs> what you th how you fire off those shortcuts. That's awesome. Coincidentally, that's the only one I really messed with too, Joe. I have that same shortcut because I was like, oh, this is cool. And I played with it a little bit, but I don't really use shortcuts much either. I also had a question from somebody who said, oh, it's so annoying, the camera. I have to take my gloves off to like get the camera to come up and blah, blah, blah. So I looked it up. I'm like, can I, is there a way to, to do this? And I don't remember if it was actually using shortcuts or not, but there's like, you can set it so that you have an accessibility shortcut by tapping the back of the phone. Have you guys messed with that one at all? That seemed like pretty cool. So you can like set that to do anything you want, basically. And so, you know, you could, 
in this case, like have it open the camera app for you and start and take a photo, I think. That's a neat one too that I think you can combine with shortcuts. So if you know you could have your phone do like a whole series of actions just by double tap on the back of the phone. But that's it's an interesting double, double one to tap. play with. So here's a quick repair tip. I know there may be some of you out there that are still putting in SSDs in iMacs. And I would say not a fair amount of the time, but once in a while, the iMac 21.5 inch is prone to cracking on the bottom when you remove the display. Only once did I actually have to buy a used one. And another time I actually lucked out, I had one here uh, that was given to me or that was deprecated by a client and I was able to swap it out and the client was none the wiser. But I find that if they get, if they're old enough, they get a little, the glass gets a little bit more brittle or a little bit more fragile from either age or heat or whatever the case may be. So one of the things that I made personal promise to myself to do is to apply a heat gun. And if you don't know what heat guns are, they're exactly what the name implies. I bought one years ago on Amazon uh, in 2009, and I've only used it a few times, but the few times that I've needed it, it was it's really been invaluable. And you could get one now for about 30 bucks on Amazon and you, they're not very special. There's some that are 20. And so what I do is it very quickly, you know, much, much more effectively than a blow dryer applies very hot heat to an area. And there, it comes usually with different nozzle attachments. And so I will apply very hot heat to the perimeter several times. I'll run the gun around the 21 inch. So as I'm removing it, the display to put in a new SSD, I never have that problem again. So that's just a little repair tip. You say, well, it's never happened to me and I've done a number of these. Well, it can happen. And I've done lots of them. And uh, you know, once in a while that they're gonna crack if you don't do this. I guess you're saying, Jerry, we can pry your heat gun from your cold dead hand. <laughs> from my cold dead hands. <laughs> Sorry. You call me I, Clint. I had to do it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So Jerry, you've, you've done a ton of those way more than I have in the field. So I, I think you have a lot more experience with what can go wrong because of, you have a higher percentage of that happening, just <laughs> the, the amount that you've done. In the rare ones that I have done, I've had, actually, I take that back. I think I've had a higher percentage of, you know, breaking glass or, you know, I, I know you had a great story of uh, a lot of episodes back about the, the front glass just falling off of an <laughs> iMac. <laughs> the home with toddlers. Oh, the wow. man who fixed the computer, he put the new hard drive behind the glass. <laughs> so clients can be a joy and they can be the bane of our existence. I got a call just recently from a client who I've heard from maybe once every 36 months. As Joe would say, they're not a price sensitive client. We're not on a budget when we buy things, but they seem to be on a vigil and a budget to try to save money with refreshing their portable line and their desktop line. So, you know, we've had these conversations and generally, you know, if it's a residential client and you're kind of kicking the can down the road, I don't normally charge uh, for those things, depending on how long they go. If they, if they do go long, I do remind them that I don't really get paid for this. I'm not selling a machine. I, I there's no remuneration here, but I'm happy to do it. But we really, can't go for a long, long discussion. So I had another one of those calls with the same client. So we go around and I said, well, you know, things change. You know, you and I, we talked 10 months ago and this is where Apple was. And now here's where Apple is now. They've just released some product. Do I think any of them are a good match for you? No, but now the things that I recommended 10 months ago, those are 10 months older than they were when I talked about it 10 months ago. So now it's not a really good time for you to think about buying something, refreshing something, because it's clear to me that you're looking at a three to five year timeline before you buy something new again. I want you to go into this eyes wide open, knowing that what potentially you could buy today is already 12 months old. Mm -hmm. So we had a discussion about MacBook Airs and MacBook Pros and that whole thing. It went a little long. So she said, well, help me with my husband and his computer. Uh, it's asking for a password and uh, we don't know what the password is. And now we're at the last try and it says that, you know, if we try anymore, it's gonna be locked. And I said, well, 
well, don't try anymore. I said, what you, you want to do is you just simply want to reset the password. We do this all the time. So she's like taking notes. Okay, reset the password. And I said, yeah, and then you'll come up with a new password and this will inevitably unlock your husband's computer. And then she said, why would Apple make it so easy for the hackers to change the password? Oh boy. Well, I think, the best thing for you to do to proceed forward is to reset the password and get access to the computer. Things change with different Apple operating systems in terms of security. So I really don't know what version of the operating system your computer is running. So I really can't adequately answer this question for you. So she pressed a little more and I said, look, I'm talking to you for free and I make money on services. And I'm happy to talk to you for a little while. And you asked me how to solve this problem of not being able to access the password. But now we're talking about hackers and Apple protecting people from hackers. I said, we could schedule an appointment. She said, well, you sound a little mad. I said, no, I'm not mad. I'm not mad. <laughs> now I just, I'm mad. <laughs> I, I just don't want to be that guy. I said, I don't want you to think of me as like, oh, I don't want to call Jerry next time I'm in trouble because every time I pick up the phone, call him, it's another $200. It's another $300, whatever it is. I said, I don't want to be that guy. And you're nice folks, and I'm happy to talk to you. But if you want to talk about security, we need to schedule time for that. But this is how you how you solve your problem. She goes, oh, okay, I understand. I totally respect that. I totally respect that. I understand. And the conversation ended. I said, if you would like, at no charge to you, I can send you a little program which will, air quotes, take the temperature of your husband's computer, and we'll see if you know there is anything wrong with it. And we'll know a little bit more information about it, like what operating system it's running. And I could make some recommendations to you. Oh, that sounds great. So I sent them off the program. They never installed it. And, uh, you know, that was that. But uh, sometimes the most well-meaning clients can be very frustrating. Yeah. And, and you were kind of doing a courtesy by speaking for her, speaking with her for that long. But I, I can see where that I, I, she can pick up the tone. Right. Like, even though you didn't mean to be necessarily like you're sure. getting frustrated and that's happened to me before as well. And I'm sure, well, Joe's like the nicest person. On the yeah, Joe's so maybe not nice Joe. Joe. Yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't get angry. I, I definitely get frustrated. And I, yeah, I mute the phone. Maybe you I'm don't frustrated. outwit me, Joe. <laughs> Joe goes to the dentist and is like, yeah, there's a lot of teeth grinding going on. What do, are you tense at work? <laughs> I do tech support. Oh, say no more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had one like that today too. I mean, they sometimes it just goes in a direction, you know, or it's a while I have you kind of question, and you're just like, I don't want to go through this right now. And and those little side questions where they're asking philosophical questions, <laughs> right, you know, right. it's just like exactly what you said. It's like let's schedule time. When you're paying for the time, you can ask me any questions you want, you know, practically. <laughs> right. And we'll just the cloud meter is running. Great, you know. Right. Right. And they always take the high road. They go, well, look, I understand if you want to send me a bill for this call, sometimes you don't want to because you want to extend a little bit of goodwill and you can understand the position they're in. And, you know, Apple does not make it always easy for people to evaluate what's the next computer I should buy. And if you're you're one of those people and I'm, you know, hopefully a lot of our clients are not those people, but a lot of folks are on the three to five year timeline. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to sell them a MacBook Air that's 12 months old already. You know, another limitation is just, again, like the amount of storage. We talk about it, you know, every almost every week, like how it's not a great feeling to be like de having to deal with optimizing the storage a year after you buy a computer or something. It's <laughs> right. like you just want to have enough space. And, and so they don't always realize that. But yeah, I mean, with the Mac Studio that came out, now that's kind of changed the recommendations a little bit. And I have some people that, you know, we talked about recently, you know, they want the larger screen or they need more storage space. And there's kind of a question. It's like, actually, the Mac Studio is not really necessary for them. What about the Mac Mini with the Mac, you know, with the studio display? You know, that's an option for people. And then then you get into it and they're like, well, you know, maybe a laptop. And it's like, all right, actually, you know, forget about the desktop Mac. Let's go with a laptop with the display. 
you know, or you then you can talk in circles and go back to let's. I'd really prefer an elegant all-in-one solution. I already got my big iPad for when I travel or something. You do kind of have to like talk to them about what their specific use cases are, what their needs are. You know, besides evaluating storage space needs and and what their preferences for like a screen screen size. You know, whether they want the 16 inch screen for when they're traveling, but and don't mind carrying the heavy weight of the 16 inch MacBook Pro, or they'd prefer like the lightest possible Mac, you know, MacBook Air to travel with. So it's you have to have some kind of conversation to really figure that out, I think. I had an architect client, he was waiting, you know, for Apple to release something. So now we're specking out the studio and the Apple display. And he's sending me after we talk, he's sending me, you know, at no charge. He's sending me emails for like 399 Acer displays. Well, what about this one? Can I just use this? At that point, you just want to do the mic drop and walk away. <laughs> just right. shut down, save changes and go, you know, shut down. <laughs> yeah, it's it because that's frustrating when, you know, th- it's costing you time to save them money. Like it just doesn't feel fair, you know, at all. Yeah, but it's side. like comparing a Hyundai to a Tesla. Yeah, trying to trying to like have that conversation to to actually explain the differences. It's taking more time. So the mic drop is like, I don't care that enough to yeah, like, right. you know, to do that exactly. for free. So like I care a lot, but like, you know, if you're gonna pepper me with like, what about this? What about this? Do I really need this? You know, all those little questions it just erodes your patience over time. We know where I am. 